So today, it's my pleasure to introduce a dear friend of mine, and probably of many of you, and it's Herb Kagan. Some of you know him from his own studies. Many of you know him from our group on Mondays. And then he also appears on Thursday night, if you're a late nighter for most of the world, um, with Alan, K Alan Berger. So Herb is coming today, and we're moving from step one to step two. And he's the first to introduce it this week. Then I believe next week, Alan will talk take his take on the second step and then next on the, month. next month next, next month oh my gosh i did it again next i'm you know i keep hoping he'll come back faster <laughs> it's next month and then the third month in the cycle the two of them will sit and banter back and forth which is always revelatory for me at least and, and it's also and kind of humorous and for each of us. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to Herb, who's going to talk about step two and its relationship to emotional sobriety and the relationship with all the steps. But the, today in particular, we're going to look at step two, the principal and emotional sobriety core value. Herb, take it away. Thank you so much, Susie and uh, Patrick, for uh, all of the series, especially this one <clears throat> that involves Dr. Berger and myself. I'm very happy to be here again. There's an awful lot of space in between us, uh, monthly talks. So it uh, don't be discouraged if you miss one. They're recorded and they're sort of module anyway. So uh, there is a connection, but it's not as... Uh, necessary to see them all and or in an order in order to benefit from them. <clears throat> Susie mentioned that this is not a official 12-step meeting, and uh, that's correct, uh, but it's founded on the principles of the 12 steps, and Bill had this brilliant prophetic, probably said more than he actually knew at the time, when he published the first edition of the big book, April 1939. And you could, if you have a big book, you could see that in the first edition, he has a preface. <clears throat> At the end of the first paragraph in that first edition and the preface to the first edition, at the end of the first paragraph, I'm emphasizing it because it's just a brilliant statement, a prophetic statement. Our way of living may have its advantages for all. He was not talking, by my interpretation, in the context. He was not talking about all alcoholics. He was not talking about all addicts. He didn't even have the concept that this methodology of the 12 steps would be a benefit to addictions other than alcohol. That wasn't in his consciousness. I'm very confident of that. But what was in his consciousness, and he had some exposure to philosophy and psychology and history at the time, and certainly organized religion. What was in his consciousness is, wow, this 12-step process of spiritual awakening itself may have a benefit for the human race. All individuals, as long as they're, as he says in chapter five, <clears throat> constitutionally capable of being honest with themselves. They, each of us can have a spiritual awakening. And this is a theme, sophisticated, quite frankly. We go to grammar school in order to go to high school. We go to high school in order to either have a technical development or a college education. It's a progressive thing. Emotional sobriety is high school. And looking at principles, core values might even be college. And so bear with the vocabulary, bear with the concepts. My sobriety date is February 21st, 1984. Whew, I've been at it for a while. Many of you, many of you weren't even born at that time. I have a website, lots of resources, all free, all downloadable. HerbK.com. I absolutely, because of COVID, have been blessed with the support of many people who have created a YouTube channel for me so that there are nine different playlists. I've even 
been able to articulate and understand the vocabulary. So there's a robust library of tools, audio and video in the YouTube world that might assist you with the entire step process or with a particular subject that you might have in mind, like emotional sobriety or forgiveness or meditation. <clears throat> And Susie announced the title. We're looking at principles. It's pretty sophisticated, actually. Practice these principles in all our affairs. What Bill meant by that, and it's in the big book on page 60 at the end of his list of steps, just after the 12th step. The 12th step says practice these principles in all our affairs. In the context of that, Bill is using the word principle as a synonym for steps. And then in the paragraph following that, he confirms that. He likes to use different words in consecutive sentences or paragraphs so that he doesn't get redundant. I mean, that's his explanation of his use of the English language. He's very precise. Every word in the big book has been thoughtfully and prayerfully determined and also historically confirmed by group conscience. Bill wrote it, the group in New York and Akron and <clears throat> Cleveland. There were three groups, probably less than 100 people, probably less than 10 or 12 people that were actually given the manuscript to vet. And Bill read people's comments and he incorporated them. The big book was written by Bill, but confirmed by group conscience. It's a wonderful historical awareness because when people say it was a gift of God, that I think that's what we mean by it, a gift of the group guidance through the Spirit. Step two, brilliantly crafted, came to believe. It's a story for a different day. Some of it might drip out today in my comments, <clears throat> but that first phrase came to believe. Many of you know, most of you don't. I was a monk. Yep. Seven years in a monastery. Seven years I wore a black robe. Seven years I meditated. Seven years I was silent. Seven years. Silent. <clears throat> And I believed I believed. And I came into AA and I believed I believed. And at 10 years of sobriety, doing the step work for the third time out of the big book with a mechanic, what I call a step guide, not a sponsor, a step guide, a project manager. This person introduced me to the set aside prayer that was prayed at the beginning of our workshop here, asking for spiritual intervention. I need an open mind and I need an open heart and I'm willing to have it, but I can't do it. God, bring your crowbar and open my mind and open my heart. That's the theme of it. But at 10 years of sobriety, having done the work twice before, having powerful stories for a different day, spiritual awakenings, transformations at the deepest level, radical changes in my thoughts and my feelings and my behavior. I came to step two in my 10th year of sobriety, doing this work for the third time. And I'm, 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 I'm emphasizing it because of the phrase, came to believe. This man gave me the set-aside prayer. Then he introduced me to unmanageability, and I understood it for the very first time, and I experienced it for the very first time. Addiction I had no problem with. The first time I went through the steps out of the big book with the project manager, I saw the allergy and the craving. The second time I saw the obsession and the delusion in the first step. 
I didn't see it all at once. And I didn't see it beginning to see it until I was four years sober and then seven years sober. And now I'm 10 years sober, 1994. And he introduces me to unmanageability. This is so relevant because this demonstrates the process that is included in the connotation of the phrase came to believe, came to believe. And with the basis of the set aside prayer and an experience of unmanageability, that spiritual malady, that selfishness and self-centeredness that is confirmed on page 62. And we can't even reduce it much by wishing or trying on our own power. End of the second paragraph on page 62, we're condemned. Even if I know what unmanageability means, even if I accept the description on pages 60 to 62 and the behavioral description on page 52, the bedevilments, I, I, I need to be delivered to an experience. I'm hoping you're hearing my willingness to take action, but the grace that delivers me across the goal line. And I didn't even know there was a goal line. I'm just watching, walking down the field with an open mind and an open heart and a willingness to listen and a willingness to take direction. And this man asked me two questions. And I'm going to ask you to ask yourself these two questions, maybe now, but maybe later. But please, either record them in your head or write them down. The first question was, 10 years sober, a month for seven years. 10 years sober, having done the work twice and having had powerful, deep spiritual awakenings by anybody's definition, that change. He asked me, well, what do I believe about God? Oh, man, I went home and I wrote a page. It was, quite frankly, theologically quite good and poetically quite aesthetic. He told me so when I came back the next week and I read it to him. And then he said, go home again. And now... Answer this second question. You just wrote what it is you believe about God. Now go home and write, how do you behave in light of what you just wrote that you believe? And I knew intuitively that that was a trap. I didn't know uh, as much as I did once I began going home and praying the set aside prayer and writing out in my meditation. An answer to the question, how do I behave in light of what I said I believed? And I saw that I was a practical agnostic. Yeah, a doubter. I actually practically, a doubt, practically, not in my head, not in my heart, practically, by my feet. By the measure of my feet, I did not believe. I didn't pray every day, meditate every day. I didn't rely on a power other than myself. I hadn't seen the truth of my unmanageability. I was restless, irritable, and discontented 10 years sober, having had two spiritual awakenings. It was embarrassing, shocking. Not with the information, but with the experience that I had never seen the information. I had never seen the experience. I never had the experience. That in fact, the big book is inviting us, use that word, step two, inviting us to make a choice about a power greater than ourselves that could restore us to sanity. By this time, I already knew the the big book's definition of sanity, because in my second journey through the steps, I had unpacked obsession and delusion through the Jim's story on pages 35 to 37. If you have read them, read them again in the light of my comments. But if you haven't read it, please read it in the light of these comments. Bill defines sanity for us. You hear all kinds of garbage, quite frankly, ignorance, well-intentioned, but ignorant in the meetings about sanity and psychiatric and psychological and et cetera. <clears throat> Sanity in the big book does not mean anything. There's no connection to psychology and psychiatry. Well, these are my interpretations. I say them as if I really know. <laughs> Trust me, I don't. But I, these are my thoughts. These are my interpretations. These are my feelings about it. <clears throat> Strong. 
at the end of Jim's story, the guy who put a little whiskey in his milk. Page 37, Bill says, this is plain insanity, a lack of perspective, a lack of healthy thinking. That's what it means in the big book. Those are Bill's definitions, page 37. Some of it's in italics. The big book's way of highlighting. <clears throat> It comes from the Latin word sanus, S-A-N-U-S, which means health. And when you put an I-N in front of the word in sanus, it just means not healthy. In the big book, that is the explicit definition of insanity. Now, we have a common way of addressing insanity in our meetings, which is actually quite relevant and quite accurate doing something over again and again and again, thinking that we will have different results. Now, we use the term in our imagination anyway, in our feelings, that different is better. When we say, oh, it'll be different this time, we mean it'll be okay, it'll be better. And, and yet it never is, but we don't remember to remember. We don't see that we don't see the truth of the deterioration, the disintegration of our lives progressively, so subtly over a long period of time. The dimmer switch goes down, the darkness descends, <clears throat> and our life deteriorates. We don't see it because we're living in it. The insanity is being hijacked by the obsession, the thought that is a delusion. The obsession is the thought. The delusion is the content. The thought, it'll be different this time. The reality, it's different, but it's always worse. And some of us, as Dr. Berger would say, we actually explicitly, oh no, it'll be better this time. I mean, that's really nuts in the sense of psychiatric and psychological. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's really important to know that step two is not going to alleviate your medical, emotional, and mental problems. Please, if you need psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, and medication, the steps will not do that. We don't go to a priest for a broken leg. What it does mean is that we will build a spiritual shield through a connection with the light, with the power, and that shield <clears throat> will protect us. That shield of our connection to light, that's about step two. This connection, this choice that we make will be the shield that prevents the obsession from hijacking us. I'll come to that again at, toward the end of the comments here about step 10 because that's where the tool of emotional sobriety is relevant to the term sanity and insanity that spiritual shield is not guaranteed until the end of the ninth step read page 84 at the end of the ninth step after the promises it says we are placed here the grace we are placed in a position of neutrality with regard to our addiction, placed in a position of neutrality with regard to our addiction, neutrality. We're not inclined toward it, nor are we resisting it. It has no relevance to our lives, consciously or unconsciously, as long as we have an effective shield, an effective relationship with the light, an effective relationship with power. More about that in a minute. We prayed the set-aside prayer. We don't need to do that. This is about sanity and emotional sobriety and the a principle and the core value. Step one. Bill makes it really clear. No choice. In fact, he spends more time on step one than he does almost any other step except step 12. 35% of the material in the first 164 pages, including the Roman numerals, is on step one. Probably 40, 45% 
of the big book is on step 12, beginning with chapter 7 through the balance of the book. For five chapters, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, I guess five chapters are on step 12. It might tell you the relative importance of step 1 and step 12. Bill says step one, or he implies it, he doesn't say it as clearly as I'm about to. Step one is the foundation stone. And then uh, in, in later on in, in step 12, he talks about step 12 is the foundation stone. I'm sorry, the foundation is step one. The foundation stone is step 12. We come in full cycle in this dynamic of the 12-step process. Not a linear experience but a spiral experience the steps don't go up like stairs concrete staircases up from the ground to the first floor they're a spiral staircase that keeps going and keeps going and we meet ourselves for the first time each time step one addiction i've made comment about that the body problem, allergy, and craving. The mind problem, obsession, and delusion. But unmanageability is the real problem. And Bill says it on page 64. And we have a physical and a mental problem, but the real problem is a spiritual problem. Read it, page 64. If we take care of the spiritual problem, the physical problem and the mental problem will take care of themselves. I'm paraphrasing. The problem of unmanageability is a problem of the will. The two things that make us specifically human is that we have a mind that self-reflects and, and we have a will that makes decisions. We're the only sentient being that has a reflective mind. We know that we know. And a ability to make completely voluntary decisions. The entire civilization human civilization has been built on the premise that each individual has free will can make a choice to take an action and that we are individually responsible for the consequences of our action this is not new news i'm just summarizing it the thing that makes me specifically human are my mind and my will the thing that makes me specifically spiritual i believe is my will and that's why it's the com key components of steps two and three. Pathetic Herbie, before 1984, didn't know that he didn't know that he had a problem with alcohol. 1988, after he knew that he had a problem with alcohol, he didn't know that he had a problem with unmanageability. He was still in bondage, but this was the bondage of self. I needed to be introduced to a process of set aside so that I would release the death grip that I had on knowing better so that in fact I could be brought to a place where I could actually do better. Knowing better doesn't mean I do better. That's unmanageability, the spiritual malady. That's why step 11 has listened to step 11 for maybe for the first time, the end part of it. Praying for knowledge of God's will, yeah, to know better, and the power to do it, because most of us know better, but we don't do better. Some of us don't know better, and that's okay, too, because we learn over time if we're in community and we're in a relationship, an effective relationship with a sponsor or step guide or mentor or companion. And we listen to that experience, and we listen to that information, and we take direction, and we take some action like the dimmer switch goes up a notch at a time in the same way it goes down a notch at a time. And Bill said it powerfully in a different way. There are only two disciplines in Alcoholics Anonymous. There are no rules. That's what I love about the 12-step methodology and the 12-step fellowship. There are no rules. Anybody who tells you there's a rule is ignorant or just mistaken, misunderstanding. There are no rules. Bill said it best. He said there are are only two disciplines in Alcoholics Anonymous. We don't need rules. We don't need guidelines. We don't need laws. We need guidelines. I'm sorry. We don't need laws. There are only two disciplines, he used that term, in Alcoholics Anonymous. 
One is alcohol and one is God. You're either going for one or you're going for the other. I like to convert it to a little more current, maybe even more acceptable language. There's only two disciplines in human life or spiritual life, depending on the words that you want to use. There's only two disciplines. One is darkness and one is light. The dimmer switch is either going up toward the light or it's going down toward the darkness and there's no resting place. It's either going up or it's going down. And the dimmer switch has an uncanny wiring to go backwards unless we stay leaning into the dimmer switch it will go down a notch at a time and we won't know that it we don't know that it's getting darker until the darkness descends and we're back into our unmanageability we're back into our obsession we're back into our allergy and craving <clears throat> But if we stay gently pressed up against the light, against the power, against God as we don't understand it, if we stay gently pressed up against the dimmer switch, it doesn't go backwards. It goes forward a notch at a time. And pretty soon there's enough light for us to see that we didn't see and then to see that we do see. My choice. Page 53. I'm only going to give you several quotes and not a lot of explanation. You can do your own work and looking it up. Bill's very simple in chapter four, page 53. God is or God isn't. Wow. What is your choice? He said, God is everything or God is nothing. He says, God is, there is no God, essentially. What is your choice? We are confronted with the question of faith. That startled me, the, the simplicity and the black and whiteness of it. God is or God isn't. A choice about power, a choice about God, a choice about light, a choice about a solution. God is or God isn't. What is your choice? We are confronted with the question of faith. I'm, 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 I'm quoting now. Page 53, we are confronted with the question. I confronted myself. What is faith? On page 47, he began to gently introduce us to the use of our free will. He says, willingness is the cornerstone. You don't have to believe, but the willingness to believe is the cornerstone. Now, he gave us, gave us a lot of wiggle room there. Just be willing, but not on page 53. He slams it home after taking us through some poetry, some philosophy, some science, some salesmanship. Page 53, God is or God isn't, what is your choice? And I see at the very least my allergy and my obsession no choice. That's pretty straightforward from my personal history. And now four years sober, I'm looking at my personal history of unmanageability, that spiritual malady of self-centeredness, as Bill describes it on page 62. And I realize I need to release or be released from my death grip on my belief that I'm the center of the world. I am the center of my world. I am just not the center of the world. And I didn't know that I didn't know. I have issues that are even more challenging than just the normal person in terms of a personality disorder called narcissism, which puts it on steroids. <clears throat> Look it up, narcissism. There are nine characteristics. My therapist at the time said, in the DSM, there's only one thing missing from those nine characteristics in the DSM. And I said, what's that? He said, your picture. I hope you're laughing. I laughed. Embarrassed. What is this principle under step two? The principle or the core value connected to emotional sobriety. Is God necessary? That's a, a picture from the Sistine Chapel. <clears throat> where God on the right-hand side of the screen is reaching down metaphorically 
in, in, in an artistic rendition in the Sistine Chapel, the roof of it, Michelangelo painting it over many years, I believe, and, and, and uh, human beings limp wrist, notice that, coming up, sort of wanting to be willing to sort of limp finger, and there's a space. I have no idea if this interpretation has any meaning to you, but it means to me, there's the mystery. I do not know what grace is. For me, it's a mystery. Somehow it's connected to a gift freely given and not earned, but it also seems to have some connection to the preconsiderations of my willingness to take action. I have the grace to have the willingness, but I have the grace that gives me the willingness to take action and the outcomes of it. Which comes first, the willingness or the action? The action, excuse me, the willingness or the grace, the grace or the uh, willingness. I have no idea. What I do know is, in meditation, I was given a poem. I was taken to a place of willingness. Hear the grace. I was taken to a place of willingness. Uh, but I was willing to be taken. My action, my response, which in itself is a grace. It doesn't explain anything, but it put me at ease. But it's a mystery. What is it? It. A completely neutral word, no valence there, no image there, no icon there, no gender there. This mystery, whatever it is, it doesn't fit into words that are finite because by definition, we're speculating, the assumption is it's infinite. Infinite, meaning having no limits, no beginning, no end. I can't even understand what the words are even though I can say the words because all my words and all my thoughts are finite. They have a beginning and they have an end and they have the limit of my cognitive ability and my experience. What is it? Are they healthy steps? It's okay. Healthy self, higher self. The Buddhists talk about the higher self. The Buddhist, Buddhism, as I understand it, I'm a dilettante study of it, isn't a religion because they don't really believe in a God in the traditional sense. They believe in consciousness and our ability to improve our own consciousness to become connected to our higher self and maybe the self. Is it human spirit? Or is it the true self, like the psychologists talk about, in contrast to the false self? As Dr. Berger would say, the best in me manages the worst in me. I love that. It takes all of any negativity and resistance out of it. The best in me manages the worst in me. Human spirit, an intangible, immaterial reality. Or some folks talk about Holy Spirit. That's one of my favorite terms. The sacred spirit. Whatever that life force is, make a choice. God or no God. Power or no power. A choice to believe. Well, what does that mean? Bill gives us a hint of it on page 47, willingness. But then on page 53, he nails it. What is your choice? Oh, it's an act of my free will to believe that there is a life force that brings this acorn into this oak tree. I do not understand it. I can give you the words life force. Or in the words of Star Wars, may the force be with you. I do believe it's a wonderful mystical story. A choice about power. Bill gave us the circle and the triangle. The circle meaning a metaphor for God, having no beginning and no end, and 
I believe he meant the triangle to be the represent representation of the 12-step uh, program, 12 steps, 12 traditions, 12 concepts, and yet it's a perfect metaphor for the human being also, the body, the mind, and the will. I have a diagram on it later on that might fill that out just a little bit more. I'm not going to spend any time on it. But it has really helped me understand the dynamic of each of the steps and then of all of the steps together. My choice about power. My concept. I can't stress it enough because the big book does. Not the big book's concept. Not your sponsor's concept. Certainly not your parents and not your... Uh, religious traditions concept, although all of that might be healthy and it might be useful to you, but you need to have your concept, your personal concept. Concept. What is it for you? My choice about power. This is the faith, mm, the decision of my free will. I choose God is. I don't know the truth of it. But that's my act of faith, a decision, a choice of my free will. He uses it again in step three, doesn't he? He changes the vocabulary. In step two, he uses the word choice. And in step three, he uses the term decision. I think it was very precise on his part. Choice has no action. It's a movement of my free will to go, I accept. I am going to believe. But in step three, he uses the word decision because it connotes the use of my free will again to have a relationship and to take the actions of steps four through nine. Decision has the connotation of action, whereas choice has the connotation of attitude. Check page 55. With this attitude, you cannot fail. Think honestly, search diligently, search fearlessly, deep down inside. And that's the only place you're going to find this reality. Read it. I'm summarizing it. With this attitude, you cannot fail. Your belief is sure to come. Came to believe. This is the cornerstone that he mentions. The willingness, the cornerstone, the first stone placed on the foundation of our complete implosion of surrender in step one. The foundation, the complete experience, not knowledge of, experience of powerlessness, no choice. We become brain dead to the word powerless because we say it and think it and hear it so often. Substitute, no choice. I have no choice once I take a drink. I will take another. I have no choice once I don't take a drink. I decide not to drink without any support on anybody's part or my part. I am bound and determined and uh, condemned uh, to drink again. Once I start, I cannot stop. Once I stop, I cannot stay stopped. And oh, by the way, even four years sober, my life is unmanageable by my will power on its own. And I need a power other than myself. This is the concept. This is the principle. This is the core value, I believe, of step two. Faith is that choice, a free choice that I can make. My choice about my concept, and it's change. Gandhi said it. My concept of God will change as I do. That first choice of concept was father. I needed to rehabilitate the term in my own experience. I had had a very hard, harsh relationship with my father, but now I'm a father and I want to be a decent human being and a good father. 
So I chose father and I rehabilitated the term in my own personal emotions and experience. And over time, I have chosen spirit and I have chosen mentor and guide and teacher. And five years ago, I chose the word mystery. Last year, I chose the word flow. This year, my terminology is light. I change it based on my need to have a more robust personal connection to based on what I want and what I need in terms of a relationship with this mystery, with this spirit, with this immateriality, the fourth dimension. What concept do I want? That's a question for you. Embrace the question. What do you want? But more especially, what do you need? Two different questions, maybe the same result. The big book suggests God as I understand it. And I love the spirit of that because it's so inclusive. But in all reality, it's God as I don't understand it. With all the thought, with all the background, with all the education that I have in psychology and philosophy and theology and the big book and history and comparative religion. I have lots of thoughts and I have lots of words. But I don't understand anything that I'm really talking about in reality. But I believe meaning I have chosen that there is this reality that is a mystery, that is immaterial, that is spirit, coming from the Greek word spiros, S-P-I-R-O-S. -S. And in Greek, that means breath. And it's the root word of spirit. Carl Jung, in a letter to Bill Wilson, made a commentary on that <clears throat> play of words. And he said... <clears throat> Alcoholics, maybe he would have said all addicts, given today's environment, are uniquely spiritual people. They have this deep existential hunger and thirst for the unknown, for the immaterial, for the spirit. They have this deep, unquenchable thirst for the spirit, and they get hijacked and distracted by spirits fabulous spirits meaning alcohol and he has the latin quote at the end of it spiritus with a capital s contra spiritum with a small s the spirit is the antidote to spirits we only need two disciplines <clears throat> light or darkness we're either going for the light or we're going for the darkness what is your concept today? What is it? No, no, not yesterday. Certainly not when you first came into a 12-step program. Maybe not even when you did the steps. How about today? Relevant to today's want and to today's needs. We saw that the core principle for step one was honesty. In fact, Bill uses a adjective in chapter five, how it works rigorous honesty. I like the word radical honesty. Recently, I heard a word and a phrase that just upped the ante a bit, ruthless honesty. And I don't mean any negative sense there. I just meant in the depth of a commitment to transparency. I have no choice. I need to admit and concede. Those are words from the big book, right? Admit in the step itself, concede on page 30, read it. Bill confirms a whole new depth of commitment to the experience of step one on page 30. We need to concede to our innermost self that we are powerless. The concept that we are, <clears throat> well, he goes on. I won't even go on with that. And in step two, faith being the core value a choice, a belief, 
I'll add to that just a little bit, though, to give it a little more depth, a little more dimension, at least from my experience, and that is the hope. In step two, there's hope. I make a decision, and then deep in me, I hope it's true. I'm expecting it. But I need it to be true. I don't know whether it's true, but I hope that it is. Bill says we're building a spiritual arch through which we walk to a new freedom. I've mentioned it, that foundation. He doesn't give us a picture, but I like to give pictures to the words that Bill gives us because I think it makes it more real. That foundation <clears throat> of full surrender. He doesn't use the term surrender in the big book. At least I've not been able to find it in the first 164 pages. But isn't that what we do? A complete defeat? We surrender, and then we are willing, because of our surrender, to take actions that otherwise we wouldn't be willing to do. He says that's the cornerstone. Of course, he gives us step three as the keystone, which we will talk about next month, and the full building blocks, I believe, of the spiritual art, even though Bill doesn't give us this, these words, the images there, that step nine is the completion. But he does, in step five, on page 75, tells us this is the spiritual arch to freedom. The last time he mentions it, as I've seen it in the big book. But that's the whole, let's not lose sight of what we're talking about here. We can use a lot of words and a lot of concepts and some of it sophisticated and fancy, but let's keep it really simple. I want freedom from addiction. That's the promise on page 84, neutrality. And then I want freedom from unmanageability. That's the promise where Bill says we're not cured. We have a daily reprieve. We've entered the world of the spirit. After step nine, we've entered, where the hell have we been? Well, we've been in the world of self, steps one through nine. We enter the world of spirit. We are rocketed into the fourth dimension, the dimension of immateriality, those first three dimensions being height, weight, and depth. The fourth dimension, the immaterial world, this world of spirit, the world of faith. We don't know whether it exists, no matter what people say. We can observe and we can speculate on the outcomes and the synchronicity of things, but it's all speculation. There's no science involved. We have body, mind, and will as the components of our humanity. Are we human beings seeking a spiritual experience or are we spiritual beings seeking a human experience? Great question. I took that into meditation. My answer is yes. Yes. Human seeking spirit, spirit seeking human. Yes. Two sides of the same coin. Bilta says we're recovered. Check it out. Second page of the big book. The first page is a title page, literally has the title, Alcoholics Anonymous. The second is a, it's a second title page, but it has some words on it. How many thousands of men and women have recovered? Don't shy away from that term. Not recovery, not recovering, recovered. And he uses the word consistently throughout the text because that's the promise. On page 84, neutrality. I am not obsessed with, nor thinking about, nor inclined to, and therefore I am not imbibing. My body and my mind, the components of addiction, have been neutralized. Dash, that my life had become unmanageable. Oh, there's the culprit. And I, although I'm neutral, neutral with regard to my addiction, I am not cured with regard to my unmanageability. Bill's not that clear, but that's, I believe, the context and the meaning 
when he says we have a daily reprieve based on the work, these promises will always materialize if we work for them. This takes us to step 10. This takes us to step 11. This takes us to step 12. Daily reprieve? I wonder what he means by that. Reprieve, stay of execution, daily. Uh, maybe that means daily. That dimmer switch will go down a notch at a time daily, and I won't know that it's getting darker until, in fact, my behavior is relapsing. And I'm surprised. But when I look back on it, I see that my relapse wasn't the drink. My relapse wasn't the drug. My relapse was a compromise of principle, the first compromise of principle. And that's the slippery slope. That's why principles are so, from my standpoint this year anyway, very fascinating. What are the principles? Rigorous honesty would be the foundation principle. The first compromise of principle. I read that in a textbook on psychology that startled me with its black and whiteness. But also its sophistication in terms of the implications my first compromise of principle. All right. My choice of concept. Oops, I'm gonna come back to that. So today you could refresh that right now. What do you want in a concept of spirit? Or maybe more relevant to today is what do you need? today to support your humanity, to support your relationship with the light, your support of one day at a time? What do you need today? Make it relevant to you as a personal choice. If we have time, and Susie usually asks me to close with a prayer, and if she does, I will have one ready for you. That's my current version. You know what's cool? I love the way you use words. You make me, well, you make me think. That's the point. Deeply about words. Just a simple word has lots of stuff behind it. And, you know, that that's really important to me. Thank you so much, Herb. Um, so, Herb told you what he thinks. And he'd love to have you uh, question him or comment on what he said, or freely speak. Um, it, we invite you to raise your hand if you would like to ask a question or speak. And we also ask that you put your uh, camera on so that we can connect with you more deeply um, and understand what you're saying and, and take it to our hearts. So, um, if you raise your hand with a question, I'll call on you in the order that you do. And um, and you need to put your camera on, if at all possible. I'd appreciate that. And so, Amanda, can you put your camera on for me? I just offered you the choice to unmute. Can you put I your can camera on? Can you hear me? In just one yes. second, I will. Of course, you pick me first, and you don't want to see me in this state. Trust me. <laughs> um, it's yeah, it's a it's a really hot day here, so I didn't think you'd even pick on me. I stumbled on this workshop when I found myself in chaos, trying to make plans happen, and somewhere along the way, I scraped my knee this morning too. I got down on those knees that I'd scraped and asked for God's will, you know. I was anxious going there. It's a potluck lunch one hour away. And there's a whole bunch of things I could list it. And as soon as I get into the car, my battery's dead. So I can't start the car. Everything's packed, unpacked, anxious and out of God's will, but I'm ready to go. And then I laughed because I thought, well, that's God's will. So my question really to you, Herb K, um, I'm just on step four in the big book awakening. I haven't even yet started working on emotional sobriety in the sense of chaos creating and all of that. But I've come to these meetings a lot that I keep hearing it. My question is, 
one, I think my concept of God like you is, I don't even know what it is, but I just keep doing the next thing, you know? Uh, so how do you, how do you check within yourself before you're at step 10? I mean, I read the pages, but I don't really do a former step 10. How do you know within yourself that what, whatever your thoughts or your decisions are, are saying God is not like, are there some signs within, within yourself that you feel like in this moment, I'm saying God is not. And then, and the contrary is, um, I guess, how do you know when God is? <laughs> well, first, first of all, let me just reinforce all of the questions you're asking are just wonderful and a gift of grace. And you don't need to have an answer to those questions. You will be delivered to an answer when you're continuing to ask them and doing what you're doing. I have total confidence. I'm hearing your voice. I'm hearing your tone. I, I hear the sincerity of your commitment. So just know that these are really good questions. And my answer to that question, and I'll, I'll rephrase it, is uh, how do I know you don't? Right. Now, now, well, no, no, it, but, but you have made a decision that God is, and if you have some real doubt about some actions that you want to take before you take them, talk to a sponsor as a sounding board, not as a parent and not as a control person, but as a sounding board for the soundness. You said you're in step four. Until you're out of step seven, you cannot trust your mind. Okay. Until you're out of step seven, you can't yeah. trust your mind. Steps four through seven are for the rehabilitation of my thinking, the rehabilitation of myself, my rehabilitation of my relationship with myself. And until you finish step seven, not step four, not step five, step seven, then you have a much better chance of knowing the truth about the lies that you've told yourself. All right, all of that. Then second, if you make a decision and even if you bounce it off your sponsor and or whatever else and you take the action, then you can know whether it was your will or God's will by the outcome. Um, yeah, by the consequences. If it achieves what you hope to achieve, it was probably in the line of flow of life and reality. If it didn't achieve what something's amiss, either with your motive or with your uh, observations and your beliefs about the, and then that's what step 10 is about, is course correction and adjustment. Mm -hmm. Bill says in, in uh, just um, at the beginning of step 10, watch for resentment, fear, dishonesty, and selfishness when they crop up he doesn't say if mm. <laughs> so so back to back to my total confirmation affirmation positive direction you're definitely on the right track breathe and be patient and stay very connected to a sponsor okay thank you <laughs> thanks amanda good luck yeah <laughs> right Okay, Charlene, come on in. It's good to see you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Herb. Um, once again, a lot of great words, ideas. Yeah. Um, my question, well, related to your last question. Um, yeah. So until step seven, we can't trust our mind. And by that well, you mean well, that yeah. that's my that's my <clears throat> That's not in the big book. That's my experience. That's all. That's, I mean, yeah, take it for what it's worth. Yeah. And I'm just going to add that we can begin to trust our mind. Correct. Right? It, it's Correct. still going to play tricks on us. Yeah. I, I, I don't trust it totally today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then my question is, um, you may have answered it, but you said that step one is the foundation. And then we come full circle to step 12 which gives us the foundation stone. That's what Bill's he, language, right? Oh, oh, he said that. So I should read what he says. I was wondering, what do you mean? What does he mean by foundation stone? Yeah. 
and, and so find the context. I forget actually where it said, but it's in one of the chapters. It's either chapter seven or further. Maybe it's a vision for you. It probably is. I haven't, I, I don't remember exactly where that phrase is, but I, it struck me that yeah. step 12 is the foundation stone, right? Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, well, Charlene. And, I, and what, I, what I believe he means by that is that it, it's the antidote to our self-centeredness. We're self-centered. That's unmanageability. That's our human condition. That's who we are. It's not a negative statement. It's just an observation as to who we are. We're self-centered on our own power. Steps four through nine is the turning from our self-centeredness to being other-centered. Other-centered meaning step 11 with a relationship with God, the ultimate other. And step 12, others, the humanity, the community of humanity. That that's the turning, that's the antidote from my self-centeredness to other centeredness. I think that's what he means by the foundation stone. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Charlene. Great question. Thank you. Okay, let's go to Robin. Would you like to put your camera on now? I will definitely. Oh, sorry, that way it was unmuted. I'm going to. Oops. <laughs> You're clicking all the wrong things, trying to do the right thing. I know that. Robin, I've lost you. Unmute. Okay, you're unmuted. There you are. Okay, I'll be there for like two seconds. Okay. I really wanted to thank you. I've I've been in and out of AA for a very long period of time, coming up on four years of real sobriety, which is something else entirely. And a couple of things today. Once again, it's stuff that I thought I knew exactly what it meant, and it turns out that it's far simpler and more complex at the same time. So, you know, I, I, I knew my life was unmanageable. I just didn't know what unmanageability really meant. So thank you for that today. Uh, and I also really took the grace to make a decision is given by a power other than myself and the Michelangelo connection. He had to, man has to reach for the connection or it isn't going to happen. And you can't stay in your little box and do all the right things without that leap. And I was fortunate enough to be given something that made me completely demonstrated no choice. <laughs> I had no choice other than to do that because I knew I was in the living in the black. Mm, yes. In the dark. Right. And I didn't want to be there. Right. And I couldn't think my way out of it. No, this is the role of suffering. Most people come to love through great suffering very few people make a decision for virtue just because of virtue most everybody i'd say 98 percent of the human race is somehow pushed through pain into taking some contrary action to find in fact virtue yeah Thank you for today. It's a, it's very interesting that I was feeling, I love my home group, Susie knows, it's how we met. But I was often present, but not attending. <laughs> I understand that. And I have been very attentive to all of this hour where you have been speaking. I have a bunch of notes, which really aren't notes. They're, they're reminders yeah. of the depth of a few words. Um, well, and, and I appreciate that. Thank well, you. I appreciate your pressing this button. Also, you don't have to suffer in order to have joy. It's a choice we can make to avoid suffering 
by going for the light, by going for the joy. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. Thanks, Herb and Robin. I'm glad you're here. Thanks. Please come back. Thank you. I will. Awesome. Hey, Sagri. Hello. How are you? Hi. Hi. Good evening. Uh, I'm Sagri. Uh, grateful Alan Nonick, um from South Africa. Thank you, Herb. You are you know, you, you are a blessing. You are a blessing. I just love listening to you and taking notes. You always have something interesting. You, you, you are absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, my, my question to you, uh, what, what does, um, you know, is mind boggling for me, um, the willingness side of it that you spoke of. Uh, we have a situation, uh, you know, in AA, um, where, where I'm so confused because here we have uh, uh, the alcoholic still coming the, uh, under the influence and attending AA meetings, and I, I, I'm not I'm not so clued up with the air uh, the the big book, but uh, that's why I'm here to learn and uh, to gauge much more. But I'm a bit confused because when we come back to when you talk about willingness and I look at the whole picture itself I mean I think like if you are sitting in that AA uh, meeting you've got that willingness so why do you keep coming why does one have to keep coming in having to drink I I worked with a man who was willing and and suffering and wanted it and worked with me on steps for 10 years before he was able to get free of alcohol yeah, my my own step guy said to me, "Willingness without action is fantasy." So that puts a you know it's hardball. Willingness is not just uh, an act of my will, unless it's moving my feet. But even so, this man took ten years to connect to the grace that set him free. I don't explain that because, in fact, my own experience is quite different. I stopped drinking to support my wife's recovery. She was in a recovery program. They asked me to stop drinking to support her recovery. I haven't had an inclination or a drink since. I didn't go to AA. I didn't pray. I didn't make a decision to stop drinking. I said, I'm going to support her recovery. I was freed. Now, you tell me how to explain grace. This man took 10 years going to AA drinking doing the steps, drinking. And it took him 10 years. I didn't do anything. <laughs> so, so, so it's a mystery. So my question is to you, Herb, is just, uh, so is it acceptable? I mean, I mean, from what you've just explained to me, that example of 10 years, so are we saying that it, it's acceptable? Is it what Bull, um, I mean, you know, you've got to, be patient with the person even so though what's your choice in? wait 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 what's your choice if you're powerless what's your choice no choice no seriously if you're truly powerless no choice what's the alternative i'm 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 without god i'm screwed that's not a quote from the big book <laughs> so keep coming back isn't that our phrase? That's correct. And, and we don't really understand, but we know we can observe if you come back, if you're willing, if you do take some action with the slightest amount, slightest amount of good faith, somehow you'll connect and, con and, and get free at some point. We cannot predict when or how. It's not up to us. It's, and that's why I really use the term mystery, not as poetry but as an observation of reality. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. It's just like, put, it puts things into perspective for me. It's, it such, a no, it's yeah. such a great question. And I'm so glad that you asked it the way we had our exchange. I think it will be very helpful to a lot of people, not personally, maybe in their own lives, but as they come to their groups and or dealing with other people with a whole compassion. I mean, we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice of grace, although I do believe 
Again, this is belief, Herb's belief that we all live in grace. We live in God. We live in the life of the spirit. But how do you connect effectively? Woo, there's, that's a subject for an hour's discussion. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. I mean, it's like made me understand things a bit more. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Right, Thanks, my, Sigri. Yeah. Thanks, Herb. My that best was awesome. South Africa. Great. <laughs> Yeah, how about that? You didn't know you're going there today. Right. Okay, Ula. Can you unmute and show me your Hi. face? Yes, unfortunately, we've got load shedding, so it is rather dark See. here. I'm in Cape Town, South Africa. They've sh sh they cut our electricity, so I'm just very grateful, Herb. It was lovely to hear to hear you and um yeah i took it took me 10 years um, and all i remember was always praying just please you know one day let me have recovery and please. i woke up one yes. day and the desire to drink was gone and i'm nine years clean so and also the understanding of this emotional sobriety oh it it takes time it takes work it takes you know, today I prayed for my willingness to be willing. There. You know, I had a situation and I just didn't know what else to do. And that's all I can do. My willingness must be willing. You know, God help my willingness to be willing. Because, you know, sometimes I get it so right and I'm in the flow. That's what I, for me, that is, I'm in that flow. And then, boom, bang, that lever just goes and I'm in the dark and it's just unmanageable and what can I do to improve that with the quiet at the moment I'm also finding you know I've I've been dealing with a lot of trauma stuff and kind of working through other programs but what can I do even like me with a meditation should I just go down to a minute again or five minutes quiet time what can you recommend to just kind of have, I need the quiet time. What, what? Just give me something, please, well, to improve it, my conscious contact with God. The um, there's there's many answers to the question that single question about improving my conscious contact. Of course, the bullseye answer is prayer and meditation, sought mm. through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact. Most people don't understand meditation. What is it? Look it up in the dictionary. It is says in the dictionary, meditation is directed thinking. When you have quiet time, it's a great term, but it's not to be quiet. It's to be robustly thinking and paying attention to your thinking as the possible response and dialogue with the God of our not understanding. It says, we ask God to direct our thinking. A prayer, God, please direct my thinking. Then it says, think. Think about the 24 hours ahead. Consider your plans for the day. What it doesn't say is what my step guide gave me, the key that unlocked the mystery to me. I was seven years a monk. I hung up my black robe in 1964 and didn't meditate again for 25 years. But this man... In 1988, 25 years later, said, and we listen to our thinking as the possible medium of the message. I ask God to direct my thinking. I begin thinking. Then I listen to my thinking as the possible thoughts, feelings, answer to coming from the spirit. Changed my life. I've been a daily meditator, effective daily meditator since 1988. I have a book called Practicing the Here and Now, and that first chapter will give you a panoramic view of prayer, meditation, contemplation, mindfulness, etc. The, 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 the panoramic view of a consciousness practice, which will probably help if you're interested. Thanks, Herb. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, Mayor, come on in. It's good to see you again. Hi, Herb. Um, you continue to blow my mind in every session. Thank you so much for your service. What you said about um, believing in God and then 
reacting to that concept and living in the light of that concept that you have it really nobody said it in a way that clicked for me so thank you so much for that um so ever since i've been with this group and with the 12th step program i'm seeing so many changes like physically in my relationships everywhere uh, i feel grace in my life now on daily basis one area where i'm still struggling is work um i avoid work i don't um want to go near it and again it i think it has something to do with abundance and past failures that i'm not able to reconcile because i know that it's 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 not an intellectual lack it's a spiritual flaw so what would you say about that and thank you for your time one of the uh, it's a great question one of uh, specifically uh, i have an experience with that i was having trouble at work I was a couple of years sober and somebody gave me the book, New Pair of Glasses by Chuck C. And in there, he changed his whole attitude toward work, toward people, toward his family, toward his friends, toward his employees. He changed his whole attitude with this phrase. How can I help you do what you need to get done? And when he changed his attitude, it changed his behavior. How can I help you get done what you need to get done? at work it changed my entire attitude toward the workplace toward my boss toward my co-workers toward my whoever and i was not perfectly of course but i was taking a much more positive attitude and it changed my relationships it resolved it along with the step work where i saw the underlying cause and condition of my mm, self-centeredness that was being manifest in my not thinking about them work was for me to get a paycheck and for me to get power and for me to get glory and for me to have control and it's kind of like oh that wasn't very helpful no wonder people and i were having problems that may not be your issue there but if you change your attitude toward work is how can i contribute to what the purpose of the workplace is that maybe then just maybe then you'll have a much better really healthier relationship Thank you. Thanks, Maur and Herb. That was awesome. A little too late. I'm retired. <laughs> well, not too late because it, it. No, of course. It, not. it applies. That principle applies to our entire so, life. Of course it does. Yeah. But thank you. Good reminder. Okay. Mayar. Maya. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. We're glad you're here. Hi. Hi. Um, you, can, uh, you can hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. That's my first time here, but uh, I just want to ask one question. Um, I have a lot of fear, fear from everything, and I'm in a relationship, and that is uh, triggering the other partner or not triggering that I make him feel that uh, she is that he is um, not not comfortable in that uh, that relationship that's in my head i don't know what he feel uh, um i'm so anxious from everything for for my study for my partner for everything um anxious and I know and I don't know how to uh, to cope that uh, don't have to know um, how to let me feel okay I'm only doing uh, external things to feel okay laughing um, laughing and loving and uh, charity everything outside of me to feel that i'm okay but actually not i'm not very okay i feel comfortable but not 100% i don't i don't feel comfortable in my life i actually have anxious pain i have anxious uh, suit and that make me 
not happy in sometimes. Uh, I have a partner and I love him so much. And I want to uh, treating him in a good way to let him feel comf comfortable and also me. So can you tell me how to cope my fear or my anxiety? And thank you very much. Um, the answer is yes. It's a very complex question that you're asking. It's a very uh, robust answer that I can give you. It's got many parts and it's not going to happen by Sunday. But if, in fact, you incorporate some of what I say, it will happen someday. That's a play on words. I hope you honor that. <laughs> but what you have, as I heard it, is fear. I really, really suggest that you do a step four inventory, one part of which is fear, so that you get to uncover and understand and rehabilitate your understanding and experience of fear. The major theme is that trust is the antidote to fear. Trust in yourself, certainly, but trust in God is the theme of the big book. And God reliance rather than self reliance, a bit glib, but still very true. But the key here, and I heard another thing, is your lack of self confidence. And that was a fear that you're not enough, you're not worthy. We have just finished a complete series on reviewing the book, Seven Pillars of Self-Esteem by Nathaniel Brandon. I hadn't been exposed to the book. It's classic. It's approachable. It's simple. It's experiential. It's very practical. It's very good. I would suggest that perhaps with a teacher or with a mentor or with a partner, that you read that book and follow the exercises that it challenges you to. But I'm giving it in the order. Do the fourth step first. Then approach the self-esteem book uh, second. And then because it's a, about a lack of confidence in a relationship, one of the books that I like is um, How to Get the Love That You Want. It's a corny title. It's a marketing title. But it's well written by, I forget the name of the author, um, but he's a renowned psychologist. The book is quite profound, quite good, quite substantial, um, quite realistic. How to get the love that you want. and But in that order, you need to deal with your fear. You need to deal with your self-esteem. Steps four through seven will be a huge rehabilitation of your self-esteem. And then um, deal with your relationship in that order. And... Um, It'll take a while, but uh, you need you you have begun with this very healthy question and outreach. Thank you for your courage and your vulnerability. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Meyer. We're really glad you came today. We hope you come back next week or any of the days during the week that we do meet because we'd love to get to know you better. Um, I have a couple questions in the chat, Herb. Get ready. Okay. Sure. Anonymous question. I'm a food addict, but also an adult child. I've been working a food program. I don't have too much time of abstinence. Should I go to Al-Anon or ACA um, and co-address other problems or focus on addiction in the food program? You know that well. Well, yeah. it's a brilliant question and it's a complex question and there's no formula here. Um, I have broad shotgun recommendations. <laughs> Stay with your food program, certainly. Uh, talk to your sponsor about that. If you have a healthy relationship with your sponsor and your sponsor is knowledgeable about the big book and the step process. Stay with your sponsor if they're not knowledgeable with the big book and the step process, but engage a step guide to go through the steps in, in parallel with the work that you're doing with your sponsor in the food program. They're very different, very different. You need sponsorship in, with somebody in an experience in the food program. I'm very clear on that. 20% of the people that come to my workshops are in one of the eight or 10 different food programs. So I have some experience, exposure more than experience to the view. Um, and work the steps. Then um, 
what was the other part of the question? Um, oh, about uh, the adult children of alcoholics. Wonderful uh, literature. I, I haven't plumbed the depths of it yet, but their textbook and their workbook look really substantial. My concern is the meetings are, they're, they haven't had a long time to develop some wisdom people. So sometimes the meetings are very problem oriented and fairly immature. Um, and uh, so I do recommend Al-Anon. Almost in any case, I will recommend Al-Anon. It's been around for 80 years. There's lots of mature wisdom people in it. They, the healthy ones are connected to the big book and the step process. And uh, their focus is about maturity and relationship and uh, personal responsibility and communication. Wisdom people, again, people who have some knowledge and who have some experience. So I, I do recommend the Al-Anon experience. I'm not a fan of multiple program belonging and activity because I think it's a, it's a dispersion of or a dissipation of energy. And the steps are the steps are the steps. So there, uh, there's no difference. There's no difference in the steps. After the first half of the first step, admitted I was powerless over my addiction. After that, everything is about God. Everything is about God. There's no mention of addiction again. In the second half of the first step, it's about my self-centeredness and my lack of personal power. And God's the answer to all of it. Now, I don't mean to be glib, and I don't mean to be religious. I hope you're hearing it from all of my comments. But I do mean to be connected to this power that we need in order to be decent human beings. I hope that helps. Thanks, Herb. Barbara, come on in. Good to see you. Oh, hi. Thank you so much, Susie. Thank you so much, Herb. Um, I think a lot of my thoughts have been answered by other people but um I had what I that was daytime dark night of the soul yesterday and and today full of fear um around step six and seven I've been in the programs for a long time and um I know in step six you know willing to hand over some defects and it says sometimes we say no not yet but I can't shift I can't shift a couple of really awful self-centered defects that are making my life really difficult and right. you know step two is good to hear because i grew up in in quite a cult where you're a sinner you're bad and the legacy of that i i do have a belief but it was said earlier my trust is is really wobbly um i am in a food program and in oa i struggle with OA, but I've got a very good sponsor. Um, yeah, I, there's a lot of fear in me, um, you know. Um, yeah, that I can't make it somehow. Something is very defective in me that I I don't know how to give up. And I, I do a two-way prayer. And anyway, I'm, I'm waffling a bit now. Sorry. No, you're not. No, no. You're expanding on your comments and your experience. It all fills in the picture. You give us a very colorful picture of your concern. Step six and seven are misunderstood in many cases. They're not, it's not difficult. They're very short, but they're very, very substantial. My experience with step six is I make a list of my character defects but in the process, and it doesn't say this in the big book, it might imply it in the 12 and 12. In the process, I look at the virtue, the mm. contrary, the antidote to the vice. If I'm dishonest, then obviously honest. If I'm uh, angry, then obviously forgiveness. If I'm insensitive, then obvious sensitive. If I'm inconsiderate, then obviously being considerate. Just the 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 vice and the virtue and and to to recognize what what it is in me and and as well informed as I am and as well intentioned as I am I'm still a Neanderthal who wants to be a Renaissance man 
All right. And so I see that. But the, the implication in the sixth step, and it was mentioned earlier about willingness, it's very confirmed in the big book. It says, if you're not willing, pray for the willingness. Yeah. Pray for the willingness to be willing. Yeah, willing to be willing. To be willing. But, no, I'm, not, I'm not finished yet. I'm not finished. Sorry. Right. All right. Um, but then the seventh step is a prayer. Listen to how it starts. My creator. That's really significant. I've been created this way. I need to be fine-tuned. I need to be rehabilitated. I need to be fixed. So I go back to the maker, my creator. All right. It's a prayer. Now, it's very clear in the big book and the 12 and 12 that it's a prayer for healing. All right. That's the word, prayer for healing. But the real healing took place when, again, this sponsor who identified the key for meditation, identified the key to the seventh step. He said, you can pray, but I want you to call me every day and tell me how you're behaving. You mm -hmm. pray because you're powerless, but you call me every day because you're human and responsible for your behavior. I'm, I'm hoping you hear the distinction between my inclination and behavior and my behavior, my inclination and behavior is the vice. My prayer is to change the behavior. And I report to a person who I trust on a daily basis or a weekly basis or a monthly basis, depending on the severity. And within 48 hours, the behavior changed. It took three years of daily prayer and regular accountability for the inclination to go away. But I got free of the behavior very quickly. I got free of the inclination over time. So six and seven are incredibly powerful, but it requires your prayer and your commitment to accountability. My experience. Thank you. It's perseverance. I, I'm a real addict. It's like instant gratification. And I've been around too long. I've been in AA for years. And but thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Welcome. Yeah, you can start today. Yeah, we'll no, do. You can change. You can change. Yes. Yeah. Old old thank dogs you. can learn new tricks. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Barbara. Herb, thank I you. love that last statement. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from an old dog. <laughs> uh, yeah, to another old dog, right? Um. <laughs> We're at the top of the hour, actually a little bit over. So I think we're going to close the meeting, but I'd really like to close it with whatever your today version of the prayer, the prayer is Good. going to be. Well, I created it this morning for awesome. us. Today. I knew you did. <laughs> for us today. This is about step two, my choice. God, I choose you are. Build with me and do with me as you choose. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do your will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of your power, your love, and your way of life. I can't see the balance of that. Oh. There it is. I choose to believe. This is step two, although I'm using a version of the step three prayer. Step two, I choose to believe. Please diminish my unbelief. 